World's Rebellion is far and away the most influential event that has taken place in the recent past of A Song of Ice and Fire. This conflict erupted due to the madness of a king, and it saw the nearly three-century-old Targaryen dynasty fall from power. Following the death of Prince Rhaegar in the sack of King's Landing, Robert Baratheon, the man for whom the rebellion was named, won the Iron Throne, and the conflict that laid the foundations of the modern story drew to an end. However, vestiges of this conflict remain. One man, a hand of the king who served Arius II, was left to stew in bitterness, hatred, and regret for nearly two decades. At the time of the main story, this lord re-emerges, ready to right the wrongs caused by Robert's Rebellion, and place a rightful Targaryen king on the Iron Throne. Today we'll be examining Lord John Connington as a character, assessing his history, his potential future trajectory, and his thematic significance to the story as a whole, and analyzing why exactly he's my favorite point of view character in A Song of Ice and Fire. John Connington, the eldest son of Lord Armand Connington, was born in the year 260 AC. In his youth, John was sent to Squire in King's Landing, alongside then-Prince Rhaegar Targaryen, heir to the Iron Throne. The two of them soon formed a close bond of friendship, and this bond would prove crucial both to Robert's Rebellion and to Connington's life as a whole. It's hinted that John's love for Rhaegar was more than just platonic, and George R. R. Martin himself has outright confirmed that Connington was indeed in love with his Silver Prince. The fact that this romantic love was unrequited did not diminish its strength, as Connington's emotional core still revolves around his feelings regarding Prince Rhaegar. One important memory that the reader gets to see from John's early life comes from Rhaegar's visit to the Connington Castle, Griffin's Roost. John looks back on this moment with fondness and regret when he eventually retakes this castle in a dance with dragons. Both Rhaegar and John were young adults at the start of Robert's Rebellion. Rhaegar went off to make prophecy babies, and John was named Hand of the King during one of King Aerys's famous bouts of paranoia. Aerys wanted someone vigorous and strong as his hand, though Tywin Lannister, who himself had previously held the position, thought that Connington was too young and too headstrong. Tywin may have been correct in both of those assertions. Despite the reservations of other lords, Lord Connington soon set out to prove his strength and win glory for himself and for the crown. He promised Aerys Targaryen Robert's head on a spike and set off into the Riverlands and Stormlands to find the rebel. Their paths eventually crossed the small town of Stony Sept, in an event that is recounted in one of John's point-of-view chapters in A Dance with Dragons. Quote, Robert Baratheon had been hiding somewhere in the town, wounded and alone. John Connington had known that, and he had also known that Robert's head upon a spear would have put an end to the rebellion, then and there. He was young and full of pride. How not? King Aerys had named him Hand and given him an army, and he meant to prove himself worthy of trust, of Rhaegar's love. He would slay the rebel lord himself and carve a place for himself in all the histories of the Seven Kingdoms. And so he swept down on Stony Sept, closed off the town, and began a search. His knights went house to house, smashed in every door, peered into every cellar. He'd even sent men crawling through the sewers, and yet somehow Robert still eluded him. The townsfolk were hiding him. They moved him from one secret bolt hole to the next, always one step ahead of the king's men. The whole town was a nest of traitors. At the end, they had the usurper hidden in a brothel. What sort of king was that, who would hide behind the skirts of women? Yet, whilst the search dragged on, Eddard Stark and Huster Tully came down upon the town with their rebel armies. Bells in battle followed, and Robert emerged from the brothel with a blade in his hand, and almost slew John on the steps of the old sept that gave the town its name. This battle, later dubbed the Battle of the Bells, leaves John Connington a broken man. It is the core traumatic event that shapes his thoughts more than anything else. Even in the main series, 18 years later, his stomach fills with knots whenever bells begin to chime. For all this failure, Ares strips John of not only his handship, but of all of his titles and inherited lands. Connington was sent across the Narrow Sea as an exile and was unable to prevent the Silver Prince's doom at the Trident. John vanished into obscurity, or before long, rumors circulate that he succumbed to alcoholism and had passed from this world. Now we arrive at the events of the main series. In the fifth book, A Dance with Dragons, Tyrion Lannister finds himself sailing east with a very strange group of individuals. Among this odd band is a man simply calling himself Griff, a grizzled warrior with dyed blue hair and a red beard. Tyrion soon deduces that one member of this party, called Young Griff, is actually Aegon Targaryen, the supposed son of Prince Rhaegar who escaped the sack of King's Landing. From there, the imp is able to deduce that Griff is none other than John Connington, 
now supporting the claim of his lost love's son. Griff is rather gruff and standoffish, particularly towards Tyrion, yet he saves Lannister's life when their boat is attacked by the Stone Men. Connington's instincts here remain protective, and it seems as though, at least at this point, there is still a core of good to John Connington. Alternatively, that might have just only happened because Tyrion had previously saved Aegon from the same Stone Men moments before. Soon after this point in the story, Tyrion is captured by Jorah Mormont, and our view on Griff and his machinations are snatched away. However, this is where a surprise occurs. It's at this point where Griff, or John Connington, or the Lost Lord, becomes a point of view character in our story. As I've stated before, he's my favorite point of view character by a pretty wide margin. And the rest of this video will be dedicated to analyzing the themes of his chapters and the weight of his story as a whole. So why is this specifically the moment where we enter Connington's head as a point of view? Put simply, his first chapter, entitled The Lost Lord, is an inflection point for his life as a whole. He has lived as an exile and as a broken man for nearly two decades at this point, and it's within the Lost Lord chapter where John finally begins his return to Westeros after such a long time. It's also a literal inflection point for the journey of Aegon and his cause as a whole, as they had previously been traveling to Marine only to decide that they would be better served returning to Westeros immediately, literally turning around and reversing their course from what it previously had been. The bulk of this chapter spends its time introducing the reader to the Aegon cause, to the Golden Company, and to Connington as a point of view character. This is done in quite an interesting and an organic way. Connington served with the Golden Company for years, while Aegon himself has not met these people before. So we, the readers, receive introductions that are needed when meeting these new characters for the first time, as Aegon is, as well as a good amount of background context from John Connington's internal narration. It's a great balance that I wish that more chapters could find when introducing new characters. This also serves as a great, full introduction to Aegon Targaryen, sixth of his name. We've met young Griff before, from Tyrion's point of view, yet the character begins to change and fully develop once he takes on what is supposedly his true name. What's more, the reader is able to observe a marked change in Connington's thoughts and actions. Previously, his presence in the story had been characterized by prudence and by planning, and yet that seems to have changed drastically just within this one point of view chapter. Connington ponders this change in Aegon, while simultaneously displaying his own internal change. Quote from the Lost Lord, When all of them began to speak at once, Griff knew the tide had turned. This is a side of Aegon I never saw before. It was not the prudent course, but he was tired of prudence, sick of secrets, and weary of waiting. Win or lose, he would see Griffin's roost again before he died, and be buried in the tomb beside his father's. The road ahead was full of perils, he knew, but what of it? All men must die. All he asked was time. He had waited so long, surely the gods would grant him a few more years, enough time to see the boy he'd called a son seated on the Iron Throne, to reclaim his lands, his name, his honor to still the bells that rang so loudly in his dreams whenever he closed his eyes to sleep. This is part of why I love John Connington's chapters so much. This is ostensibly a new character. We've only interacted with him for a few chapters at the start of Dance, and yet there's still a very distinct shift in his character. And it's at the end of this first point of view chapter, where the reader learns the reason for his new attitude. The Lord of Griffin's Roost contracted Grayscale while saving Tyrion from the Stone Men, a deadly disease that surely means you will die within a few years of contracting it. George R. R. Martin often states that the only thing worth writing about is the human heart in conflict with itself. John Connington is the exception that proves this rule. He enters the story as a typical George R. R. Martin character, conflicted about the pace of advancing Aegon's claim and the potential dangers to the young prince. However, contracting Grayscale removes that conflict entirely, Connington is a man reborn, driven by knowledge that he has only so much time left in this world. John resigns to use what time he has to advance the one thing in this world he still cares about, Aegon's claim. He failed the father, but he will not fail the son. Connington strikes a perfect balance that I believe is necessary to create an excellent character, that being between the strength of his motivations and the urgency of those motivations. Connington is driven by the regret and the sorrow of his lost love, and being placed on a timer acts as an accelerant. Over his 18 years in exile, Connington became a powder keg. Contracting Grayscale lit a fuse to this bomb, potentially spawning the doom of many and the glory of Aegon Targaryen. Connington's second chapter fully emphasizes this change in Jon. He's no longer just some lost lord. 
He is the Griffin Reborn, returned to Westeros in order to reclaim his rightful castle. This is the first attack of Aegon's reconquest of the continent, and it goes incredibly well. Connington anticipated losing over a hundred men, but only loses four in his recapture of Griffin's Roost. He captured the castle by surprise, and was able to reclaim it pretty easily. Now that Connington has returned to his helm, the emotions of the past begin to bubble to the surface. He reflects on his time with Rhaegar, and what is one of my favorite quotes in the entire series. Quote from the Griffin Reborn. His father and his father's father had never lost their lands. He had. I rose too high, loved too hard, dared too much. I tried to grasp a star, overreached, and fell. It is at this point that John reflects further on the Battle of the Bells, remembering the circumstances that led to his exile and to his loss of lands. These memories shine a light on the reinvented John as well, and could give indication as to how he'll conduct himself in future warfare. He remembers his actions being compared to those of Tywin Lannister by an old friend from the Golden Company. Quote, Lord Tywin would not have bothered with a search. He would have burned down that town and every living creature in it. Men and boys, babes at the breast, noble knights and holy septons, pigs and whores, rats and rebels. He would have burned them all. When the fires guttered out and only ash and cinders remained, he would have sent his men in to find the bones of Robert Baratheon. Later, Stark and Tully turned up with their host, and he would have offered pardons to the both of them, and they would have accepted and turned for home with their tails between their legs. This passage gives the impression of admiration for Tywin, and may indicate a generally more ruthless strategy from Connington going forward. He's no longer concerned with personal glory, but rather with advancing Aegon's claim by any means necessary. John Connington serves as a bit of a parallel to Jaime Lannister throughout this chapter. Both are aging knights past their prime in battle, attempting to come into their own as a commander by taking a castle. Both of them compare their tactics to those used by Tywin, and both men have a health concern involving their right hand that causes them to reconsider their philosophy and place in the world. Martin loves his parallels, and Connington may continue to be a dark mirror for Jaime moving into the winds of winter in many different ways. Connington's role in the future of this series seems to be as Hand of the King to Aegon VI Targaryen. We hear from Halden Halfmace during a sample chapter of The Winds of Winter that the young king's forces have already laid claim to Storm's End and intend to meet Mace Tyrell's army in open combat. It does seem quite likely that Aegon's forces will win this battle, and from there claim the Iron Throne itself. The best indication of this comes from Daenerys' visions in the House of the Undying. She sees a clothed dragon swaying on poles above a cheering crowd. This seems to indicate both that Aegon could be a fake Targaryen, a black fire, bright flame, or something else, what have you, and that he will have the support of the common people. However, Connington might still prove quite dangerous, even if Aegon does have this popular support. Danny is coming for Westeros, and it seems as though she will attempt to take King's Landing at some point. We saw this in Game of Thrones, where she goes crazy for no reason and does some light war crimes. This episode is entitled The Bells. However, as we've just discussed, we have a character who is actively going to be impaired by Grayscale, who is going to be the second most powerful person in the city and debatably on the continent, who has PTSD related to Bells. It seems quite likely that John Connington will be the one to instigate the burning of King's Landing rather than Daenerys. I've got a whole video on this topic specifically, which I'll link in the cards. It's about Grayscale as a whole and John and Connington's future in the Winds of Winter and how that might play out in relation to the disease and its spread. It's also good to note that we really don't know much about Connington's chapters in The Winds of Winter itself. We know that he will have chapters that has been confirmed by the author, George R.R. R. Martin. However, he has not received sample chapters as many other characters have. It seems as though Martin is keeping the chapters of characters who are involved in pretty major events pretty close to the vest, at least in terms of releasing samples, as we haven't gotten any from Connington, from Jamie, from Cersei, from Jon Snow, obviously because he's dead. Daenerys, etc. So the closer characters are to major events, the more likely they are to have not received a sample chapter. So it seems as though whatever is going to go down at Storm's End at the beginning of the Winds of Winter is going to be fairly interesting and fairly important. John Connington is a man of singular focus. He's running out of time due to a deadly disease and is willing to do whatever it takes to put the son of his beloved Rhaegar Targaryen on the throne of all Westeros. His life up until the modern day has been defined by failure and by regret, and it seems as though he has one last chance to make everything right. John Connington is my favorite point of view character in A Song of Ice and Fire, as I find him incredibly compelling for all of the reasons listed in this video. 
Thank you all so much for watching. This has been a really fun uh, deep dive into his chapters and just general character study. If you like this and like this format, be sure to let me know. I'd love to do more of these for more characters in the future. If you do want to see me do more of these, suggest a character in the comments below. I'd love that as well. Also, while you're down there, be sure to like and subscribe as it does really help me grow the channel and just generally makes me feel good. I don't know why you people are listening to me talk, but I'm glad that you are. It, uh, it makes me happy, and I'm glad to be able to talk about this with other people who are similarly passionate about the subject matter. I will have more videos coming in the near future. I'm currently working on a collaboration as well, so hopefully that'll be fun. And yeah, thank you all for watching. I hope you all have a great uh, rest of your day. I will see you all soon.